In my last video, I talked about the institutions and culture of the Sasanian Persian Empire. Well, in this video, I'm going to go over the history of Persia from 224 to 651 CE, and will hopefully hit on most of the major events and rulers without being too long-winded. So, let's get started. Let's briefly recap the history of Persia. So first there was the Achaemenid Empire founded by Cyrus that was destroyed by Alexander the Great. His main successor in Asia was Seleucus and his Seleucid Empire. And at a certain point in Seleucid history there was a revolt in northeastern Iran under a group called the Parthians who then founded what became the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire had lasted from about 200 and something BCE all the way down to 224 CE and it had developed a rivalry with Rome around the year 50 or so BCE that had continued. And for the most part, with the exception of the Battle of Karai, the Parthians were normally on the receiving end of the beatings that took place between these two powers. Now, these beatings got particularly bad uh, during the 2nd and early 3rd centuries when the Romans would inflict some pretty humiliating losses on the Parthians. Um, the Parthian Empire had some institutional problems. There was a weak monarch who was more or less elected by his aristocratic houses. And of these houses, there were not very many of them. There were maybe seven at best, maybe as few as four. And these aristocratic houses would more or less uh, dictate policy to the king and could withhold their support in a war, which was obviously not good if you have a major Roman invasion. And also there was a regional prejudice that took place because the Parthians were not seen as properly Persian because they were too far from the original homelands of the Achaemenids. So there were other Persians who had a lot of resentment against the Parthians. Ardashir really capitalized on that and really looked to reestablish the glory days of Persia. So he set up camp in his home area and then went about fighting the Parthians. There was a division among the Parthians during his time and he defeated them by 224 CE and then declared that the time of the Parthians was over and that the time of the House of Sasan had begun. If Ardashir was the founder of the Sasanian Empire, then why is it called Sasanian? Well, the reason is that the ruling family is called the House of Sasan, and Ardashir named this house in honor of his grandfather, whose name was Sasan. So that is where the name comes from. To the best of my knowledge, there was no monarch in Sasanian history who actually took the name Sasan. All Sasanian rulers came from the House of Sasan, even the usurpers and puppets who were backed by rival aristocratic factions were all cousins of one another in one way or another. And here is a picture of Ardashir's original capital before he finished off the Parthians while he was still a rebel. This was at the modern day city of Firuzabad. Um, after he won his victory he then chose a different capital. Let's look at the early years of the Sasanian Empire. So when Ardashir took over, he would then rule for about 18 years from 224 to 242. And in that time, he set the tone for what the empire would be. He was very much into looking back on the Achaemenid past, so he adopted a lot of the imagery of that regime in his official um, architecture and in his monuments. And along with that imagery came the intentions of the Achaemenid Empire to be a great sort of universal empire, something which would expand and encompass all the area around it. He also took the title Shahan Shah, King of Kings, which is another throwback to the great kings of Persia, including Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and all of those fellows. And he renewed the rivalry with Rome. So, whereas the Parthians had mostly been there to take hits from the Romans, the Sasanians would not be nearly so weak or passive, and would be the true equals of the Romans. And that really 
will start to be a thing under the reign of his son Shapur I, who first won some battles in the east. He annexed Bactria, which is basically part of uh, modern Afghanistan. And then he fought two of the many 3rd century Roman emperors. If you look at the 3rd century crisis of Rome, you'll see that these are two of those emperors, and that their defeats at the hands of Shapur helped to prolong Rome's period of virtual anarchy and civil war, the 50-year period. Um, and he cap captured two of them, Gordian and Valerian. And Gordian Val and Valerian are both pictured in the relief as the guy standing and the guy kneeling before the mounted figure who is Shapur I. And that shows their submission to Persia and the superiority of Persia to Rome. Um, the, one of the next rulers, Baram II, actually had a lot of problems trying to fight the Romans. So once the Romans got reorganized, uh, the Persians found that, you know, things weren't as easy anymore. So um, the Emperor Carus actually managed to take Ctesiphon, but then Carus fell ill and died. So that spared the Persians, however, it did not spare Baram's reputation. He had lost the capital to some Roman, and not even a Roman who controlled the whole empire. So after Baram then went on to lose Armenia to the Romans, um, he died, and his son Baram III tried to take power. However, everyone was sick of that branch of the family, and the, uh, his son basically was toppled and executed for his father's failures. By the start of the 4th century, we see that both of the major powers, Rome and Persia, had been renewed, and with that greater power that they had, they were going to fight more wars. So, in the West, Diocletian had reunified the Roman Empire, and ended the 3rd century crisis, Rome state would reorganize in a similar fashion to the way that the Sasanians reorganized with the Parthians it had, and now they are getting aggressive towards the Persians. Um, many of these wars will be wars by proxy, especially in Armenia. Um, the Romans will constantly try to put kings in Armenia, and so will the Sasanians. Influence there will fluctuate back and forth. And by around the year 300, the old balance of power where Rome is definitively stronger than Persia will reassert itself. However, um... Rome will never be as powerful vis-a-vis -vis the Sasanians as they were vis-a-vis -vis the Parthians. The balance will be a lot more even when Rome faces the Sasanians. Shapur II is born in 309 and will live until 379, and he is an extremely important figure in Sasanian history. He was actually born in office as king, uh, his father died a couple weeks before, and when he was born, he was immediately crowned. And he didn't actually govern until the age of 16. However, he is so important that we'll see that there's a whole age that is dated after him, which basically just assumes that the moment he's born, everything got better. And here is a relief that shows Shapur II, Ardashir II, who was one of his sons, and Ahura Mazda triumphing over Julian when Julian invaded the Sasanian Empire in 363 and died near Ctesiphon. The first Golden Age occurred between 309 to 379, which is to say that it is precisely coterminous with the reign of Shapur II. Now, because Shapur only took power at age 16, this means that the first 16 years of this age don't actually have anything golden that happens. Nonetheless, we'll stick with this the, um, description of Sasanian history, since as far as I know, this is the standard way to look at it, despite the fact that it doesn't really make all that much sense. But anyway, so Shapur II immediately upon taking power renews the war with Rome, but the frontier cities of Mesopotamia such as Dara and other really well-fortified cities, prevent the Persians from expanding even after they win some battles. Um, while Shapur is trying to do this, and these uh, sieges are going back and forth, um, there's an attack in the east. So Shapur goes east to deal with the nomads, and he ends up not only driving them off, but then expanding Sasanian control 
um, further outward, so gaining even more of Bactria than his predecessors had had. His crowning achievement, though, came in 363 when the ambitious Emperor Julian the Apostate invaded Mesopotamia with a huge army. And um, Julian's invasion got botched because of one of his subordinates messing up. And Julian tried to lay siege to Ctesiphon and failed. And then he was killed in the skirmish as he was trying to retreat. He had a hapless successor named Jovian. And Jovian agreed to some very bad peace terms in order to get what remained of his army home. Um, and in that treaty, some of the terms included that Rome had to pay money to Persia and also give up some lands. So this is one of the great achievements in Sasanian history. They won a major victory over a large Roman army and a major emperor. Um, this is also a period when Persian culture flourished, and we see that Persian culture at this time is starting to reach into India. Manichaeism is uh, born in this century, among other things. And we also see Persian artifacts cropping up more and more in Central Asia, India, and other adjacent regions. In my previous video on Sasanian Persia and its institutions, I mentioned that the Sasanian state from time to time would engage in persecution, but for the most part was content with just promoting Zoroastrianism and then letting most other people do as they please. Shapur II is one of the best examples of this since he kind of covers all the bases for um, his empire's religious policy over the course of his long reign. So Shapur II, one of his lifelong goals was to increase the authority and role of Zoroastrianism in his reign, and this is sort of a mirror move to what Constantine does with Christianity in the Roman Empire. Um, this is also when Zoroastrian priests really gain a lot more authority than they had before. And Shapur did resort to persecution to try to break Christians. So, although some other rulers before and after him would be more friendly towards the Christian Church of the East, Shapur tried to break their will by doubling their taxes. So, if you were an Eastern Christian, you'd have to pay twice as much in taxes as a Zoroastrian citizen. But by and large, uh, Shapur actually was fairly friendly with the local Jewish population. And that was also fairly typical for Sasanian rulers. But, of course, there were times when that wasn't true. And, um, you know, Shapur did try to spread Zoroastrianism to Armenia. And it's something that his successors kept up. But that was something that never really took hold for whatever reason. The Armenians never ended up going for Zoroastrianism, and they became Christian in later years and remained that way throughout the rest of their history. When Shapur II died in 379, his death marked the end of the First Golden Age and the beginning of the Intermediate Age, which ran from 379 to 498. This period was marked by mostly peaceful relationships with Rome. Um, the Romans were busy with all kinds of problems, and the Sasanians had problems of their own, but not quite as severe. There are several inactive kings during this period who don't really do a whole lot, and you aren't really all that well recorded in the Roman sources because, you know, they didn't do too much towards Rome. The best well known emperor or uh, king of this period is Baram V, who ruled from 421 to 438. And he is someone who went on to become a legendary figure. There are stories and tales about him in the literature of later Arab writers. And even after the fall of Persia, he is you know talked about and recorded in song. Um, he was a patron of the arts, and under him there was a lot of literature and music produced. However, it's not really clear exactly what he did historically, if anything, that was all that important. Um, he's sort of one of those guys who's really well known, but he may or may not have actually been that great. So it's sort of like a lot of people who remember the mid-2000s can remember that Kobe Bryant played with Smush Parker and Kwame Brown. But other than their brief stints with the Lakers during that period, no one else knows anything about those two guys. It's kind of like that with Baram V. He gets into the literature for being like this great hunter and guy who was good at like seducing women and whatever. 
We don't really know how good of a king he actually was. We only know that he had some fans at court and that poems were written about him. Uh, also, Baram is the guy who introduced the sport of polo to the Persian nobles. Um, it's another aristocratic sport where you ride around on a horse and hit things while mounted, so it's good practice if you want to become a horse warrior. Um, the 5th century marks the beginning of the Help the Light attacks. One of the first one occurred under Baram V, and he repelled it, so that is one deed that we know that he did. And one of his successors also succeeded in repelling a Help the Light attack. And by the way, the Help the Lights are also called the White Huns. Just fun fact. The King Paraz I rules for 30 years, but he has a lot of problems handling the Help the Lights in his last decade. And he actually loses control of the eastern provinces to them for a couple years. And at one point, the Hephthalites are in a position to threaten the capital. And Paraz, of course, is a pretty failed king for just that alone. Paraz I died in 488, and the I was able to take power. After about 10 years, Kavad is able to resolve these crisis with the Hephthalites, and then he becomes the father of two of Sasanian Persia's most important policies. One is that he manages to contrive a way where he forces Rome to offset part of the cost for the Persian defense of their own frontier against the Hephthalites. He makes the argument that if the Hephthalites were to break through Persia, they would come for Rome next, and that they would be an unpredictable and um, really savage enemy. So he basically extracts money from Rome to subsidize his own defenses and if Rome starts to slack on his payments the Persians will attack and they'll use the excuse that unless they get enough booty from the Romans that they won't have enough money to defend themselves from the Helpthalites. And this argument works on Anastasius, who was the Roman Emperor at the time of Kavad, when Kavad was uh, coming up with this kind of policy. Because Anastasius was fairly eager to save money, and it's actually cheaper to buy off your enemies than to field armies and fight them, because uh, maintaining armies in the field is very expensive. Kavad also comes up with the policy of backing the Lakhmid Arab Kingdom, that was a fairly major thing, and this leads to proxy wars among the various Arab groups that are backed by either Rome or Persia. And this will also have a major role to play in the um, gaining of greater political experience and large-scale organization by the Arabs uh, going into the rise of Islam. Chazro I, Anushirvan, which means the immortal soul, is often considered the greatest of the Sasanian emperors or kings, whatever you want to call them. And one of the major things that he did, the most important thing, is to do a complete overhaul of the government. And most of what this entails is empowering the Dakans, who are more or less like a low, low level nobility, comparable to what knights were in later Western Europe, and making them his agents while in order to keep the high nobles and some of the bureaucrats in line so by doing this he fights corruption and increases the efficiency of his government pretty substantially so he you know was one of the greats his son took over after he died but then when his son died his grandson Chazro II wanted to come to power and the problem is uh, he had to face a usurper, and he went to Maurice for help, and Maurice was more than willing to help the Roman Emperor, or Byzantine Emperor. And Maurice managed to get some land out of Chazro and went back to fighting in the Balkans. And then Maurice dies, and now Chazro can intervene in Byzantine affairs under the pretext that he has to fight the usurper Phocas and avenge his great patron Maurice. And what this really amounts to is a full-scale land grab at the expense of the Byzantines. Chosro's invasion to avenge the fallen Maurice begins what is known as the Byzantine-Sasanian War, which lasts from 602 to 628. 
this is a poorly named war. Someone needs to come up with a much better label for it to create some disambiguation between this war and previous smaller conflicts. But unfortunately, scholars have been lazy in that regard, and we're stuck with this very inadequate label. So, um, at first, the war was relatively even, and the frontier was holding, even though the Sasanians were on the offensive. However, in time, the Byzantines were very strung out. Their Balkan uh, holdings were also being overrun by the Slavs and the Avars. So, the Byzantines were vulnerable, and at some point, either on the watch of Phocas from 602 to 610, or Heraclius 610 to 641, the frontier collapsed. And it looks like it was right about the time that Heraclius arrived in Constantinople and deposed Phocas. So that would have been around 610 or maybe slightly later, 611. A lot of scholars now think that it happened actually under Heraclius and not Phocas, and that it just looks like Phocas because he was a usurper who then was himself usurped. I don't know. Anyway, the frontier collapsed. The Persians overran Asia Minor. They overran the Near East, so the coast of Syria, um, what's now Israel, Egypt. More or less, the breadbasket and main population center of the East was overrun by the Persians. And this is the high tide of Persian history. Never again would the Sasanian Empire be this big, and never before was it anything like this. However, um, despite the fact that things look good on the map, um, Chosro wants to go for the kill. He's having some trouble with Heraclius, who's gotten unconventional on him. And he lays siege to Constantinople in 626, and he gets help from the Slavs and Avars, who are also eager to put paid to the Byzantine Empire and then divide the spoils with their Sasanian allies. However, this siege of Constantinople doesn't work, and here's why it failed. So by 622, which is considered to be the last year of the Second Golden Age in Sasanian history, the Persians had overrun everything, and Heraclius basically just controlled his own capital, and then some Greek islands and maybe some parts of Greece itself. Um, the Byzantine Empire was all but dead. So Heraclius picked up his field army and then sailed around Asia Minor and basically invaded the northeast of Asia Minor and started pushing towards Mesopotamia. So it's a pretty desperate maneuver. And the only reason it works is because there are a lot of ambitious Persian generals who want to engage and defeat the emperor, who they assume will probably be the last emperor of the Romans. So they meet him in battle and he's able to win all of these field battles and he's able to then enter the homeland of the Sasanians, Mesopotamia. So in 627 that officially makes Chosro have to break his siege of Constantinople in order to defend his own rear. So that means that he has to abandon all the stuff that he gained in the last several years. Um, what happens then is in 628 there's a decisive battle where Heraclius defeats Chosro and they have to sign a peace agreement. Now what happens is the antebellum borders are restored, so Chosro has to withdraw all the garrisons he left and return all of that to Heraclius. In exchange, Heraclius leaves Mesopotamia. And it might look on the map like everything was back to normal, however, that's not quite the case. Um, the Both states are very much weakened. They've seen their core territories take damage and, um, you know, withstand devastation and actually the devastation is worse on the Persian side believe it or not so although the Romans or Byzantines were occupied for longer the amount of damage that was done during Heraclius's campaign was actually greater so he actually did more damage to Persian lands than they were able to do to his and public support among the Sasanians for their empire was waning because of how costly this war had been um, to pay for it, Chosro had started levying really heavy taxes, and once uh, you know the people and the homeland of the empire started to get invaded by the Byzantines while their king was trying to lay siege to a distant city they didn't care about, it became harder and harder for them to really get behind this effort. In the immediate aftermath of Chosro II, there were five weak rulers who didn't really do much, and two of them were his daughters, 
who are the only two female rulers in Sasanian history. Um, the only time that women could come to the throne is when there was no available male heir, and that was the case in this time. The male line had been more or less wiped out by war, or so it seemed. But actually, there was one last male Sasanian waiting in the wings. In 632, a teenager who had been in hiding revealed himself and revealed that his heritage was as the son or grandson of one of the previous kings of the House of Sasan. So the Persians deposed the last female ruler and put Yazdegerd III on the throne in 632. Now 632 is a pretty major year in world history. This is the year when the Arab invasions began, or as they're sometimes called, the Islamic conquest, whichever term you prefer. By this point, after several years of more or less chaos in the capital, the nobles had decentralized the government and the kings had lost a lot of their power since you know we'd had five weak kings in a row following Chazro II. Now, as soon as Yazdegerd took power, there were heavy Arab raids in the Mesopotamia. Um, it looks like the Persian high command of the king and his advisors didn't take this seriously. Arab raids were common, and they figured it was just a consequence of the relative weakness of their empire and something that they would rectify pretty quickly and, you know, pretty decisively. But eventually it became clear that this was a full-on invasion as the Arabs began to occupy areas. So Yazdegerd got his army together and went to meet the Arabs, and he fought at the Battle of al qadasiyah And at this battle, which I probably mispronounced horribly in 636, the Arabs heavily defeated Yazdegerd and were able to overrun pretty much all of Iraq. Around this time, maybe slightly before, most likely slightly after, Yazdegerd actually married a daughter of Heraclius, and that is supposed to mark a, an alliance between Persia and Byzantium to face this new threat. Um, by this point, Heraclius was also under invasion, and he was fighting for control of Syria and losing. Um, now, while the Byzantines would survive the Arab onslaught, the same cannot be said of the Persians. Um, Yazdegerd was the last of his line, and he was not really someone who was able to stop the Arab invaders. And he continued to try, though, until the year 651, when he was finally murdered and the Sasanian Empire came to an end. And after he died, the Persians who had been resisting, who were increasingly few, basically gave up and that is the end of Sasanian Persian history and it'll be quite a while before we'll see another Persian state and the next time we see a Persian state it will be the Safavid Persian state however um, the Sasanians will leave a deep legacy and a lot of their institutions will be taken up by the early caliphates like the Umayyads and the Abbasids